Hello and welcome to the world around us. There's a great deal happening in the world around us which we get to hear nothing about. This is because it tends to be only the hard news that gets covered. In this program, we're going to try and bring you some of the other stories which in their way are more fascinating than the hard news. This week we take you first to Dubrovnik in former Yugoslavia to see what the war has done to it, then to a cartoon factory in the Philippines, then to England and a story on the spread of hepatitis C, then to Panama and the imminent departure of American troops, and finally to a dragon boat race in Hong Kong. For us in India, the full horror of the war in Yugoslavia has not quite registered. Even in these days when television brings pictures of bombed out villages and dead children right into our living rooms, it is not possible often to gauge the extent of the destruction. It takes the story of a mother's pain at the loss of her son and a city's pain at the loss of its civilized past to bring home the awful realities of Yugoslavia. You will hear both these stories in this story from Dubrovnik. Chamber music in a palace on a summer's night. This is how many people see the city of Dubrovnik. It's a cultural treasure on Croatia's Adriatic coast. At first glance, the violent breakup of Yugoslavia seems to have spared Dubrovnik. Though only a short drive from Bosnia, there's been no serious gunfire here for more than three years. The scars of war are not obvious. A few perforated rooftops, the splatter of a mortar shell on a public square. It's been cleaned up and patched, and the music is still playing. But Mariana Urban knows that things have changed and may never be the same again. The library she manages, a storehouse of 250,000 books, was hit by shells. Three years later, it's still a wreck, a testament to cultural vandalism on a grand scale. Luckily, many of the rare old manuscripts were saved. But Mariana's son, Pavo, did not survive. On the 6th of December, 1991, the young photographer found himself on the assignment of a lifetime. It was St. Nicholas Day. Mariana recalls that Serbian and Montenegrin troops around the city were firing mortars and rockets into the center of Dubrovnik. She telephoned her son. I begged him not to leave his workshop because things were awful. There was tension in the air. The shooting was terrible. But Pavo couldn't resist. From under the cover of this archway, he shot a roll of film. One by one, the shells dropped closer to his position. Mariana says something compelled Pavo to step out into the open. He snapped this one final blurred picture. Then a shell tore him apart. It was the last photograph of his life. Later, it was published as part of a book chronicling the agony of Dubrovnik. Many mothers on both sides wear black now, but they are not to blame for this war. The ones who gave the orders are responsible. The people who have plans for Croatia and Dubrovnik and everything else in the Balkans. That's why we can forgive, but we can't forget, ever. Pavo is one of 170 civilians killed in Dubrovnik. That's not a high body count by the standards of the Yugoslav war, but the shock of what happened and the senselessness of it may have crushed the heart of this city forever. Among the targets were a number of old Catholic churches. It was no accident. Many of Dubrovnik's Croatian citizens are devout Catholics. The Serbian attackers were Eastern Orthodox. Fifty shells landed in this 14th century Franciscan monastery. Luckily, they caused no serious damage. Within these walls, artists have long worked to restore old paintings from the ravages of age. Now, they have to deal with the ravages of man. One of the targets was this historic painting. Serbian and Montenegrin soldiers cut this painting in the church with knife. This is cut by knife.
The people of Dubrovnik always prided themselves on being above the ethnic hatreds that were tearing Yugoslavia apart. In this city lived Muslims, Serbs, Croats, Jews. They got along for centuries. But Father Joseph Sopta, a Franciscan monk, says the war and its aftermath left deep wounds. We have suffered not only economic and structural damage, but also spiritual damage. We have suffered so much, and we feel deep inside ourselves something that is not pleasant. The war is responsible, and we need a lot of time and a lot of humanity to learn again how to forgive. In time, the shelling stopped. The people cleaned up the rubble and tried to resume normal lives. But three years later, the cafes are still empty, and the restaurants wait in vain for tourists to return. Some of the bitterness is directed at the United Nations, whose cultural agency, UNESCO, had taken Dubrovnik under its protection. Mayor Nikola Obulyan says this was a useless gesture. Dubrovnik is, was, and still is UNESCO-protected city. And what use we had from this? Nothing. We were attacked, we were damaged, we were destroyed, as you could see. And now we are trying to find help to repair, uh, reconstruct, and so on. Why couldn't somebody stop this? Recitals like this are part of an effort to help erase the shock of war here. But as long as Croats, Serbs, and Muslims continue to fight one another in neighboring Bosnia, life here will not return to normal, and the nearby war will continue to cast a shadow over this city of culture. This is Claude Adams reporting. From sadness to joy, the joy of cartoons and a trip to a cartoon factory in Manila which supplies Hollywood with some of its best known cartoon strips. Why do Americans need to go to Manila in the Philippines to make something that is so quintessentially American? Because labor is cheap and the Filipinos speak English and understand American culture. Hours combined. I am Captain Planet. Polluters beware, here comes Captain Planet. Born on a Hollywood drafting table, he is a supernaturally endowed crusader for Mother Nature and a contributing member of one of show business's most profitable corporate families. Captain Planet may be a product of Hollywood, but his special powers can be traced to this building halfway around the world. Here on the outskirts of Manila is where the superhero gets his moves. With 600 employees, Phil Cartoons bills itself as the world's largest television animation studio. It was set up by the cartoon giant Hanna-Barbera in 1987 and has already produced a million feet of film for its parent company and for other studios. Hey, watch where you're going, Flintstone. For more than 30 years, the major cartoon companies in the United States and Europe have relied on low-cost labor, mainly from Asia. Despite advances in computer technology, nearly all cartoon animation is still done by hand. Ricky Yawinko is one of Phil Cartoon's top animators, and he's one of the reasons why the Philippines has started making inroads on traditional animation powerhouses like South Korea and Taiwan. Educated in English, Yuinko has no problem understanding the detailed instructions sent by headquarters in Hollywood. And as an added bonus, he gets the jokes. You know, you have to get the feel of the gag, the, the kind of humor that the Americans want. Uh, it has to be, you know, you have to be a bit of a loony or crazy. Bill Dennis is the studio's general manager. He says Yuinko's American-style sense of humor is good for the cartoons and good for business. It, there's a very strong Western mentality here, which is very important for our product because our product airs primarily in the United States. It does air around the world, but primarily our biggest market is the United States. So if you're giving it to a handful of artists that understand Western humor, 
it's a lot easier for them to sit down and act it out and to animate it for you. But the Philippines' main selling point is cost. It takes at least 12 weeks for a 22-minute episode of Captain Planet to move from storyboard to finished product. The process would cost more than half a million dollars if it were done in the United States, more than three times what it costs here in Manila. Even Taiwan and Korea are finding it hard to compete. We'd see Captain Planet here from this position coming out of the water here. You know, the water splash and everything. And then coming up towards the sky in a different angle. As animator, Yuinko's job is to produce four or five key drawings in pencil. Other artists provide the drawings in between. Top animators like Yuinko can make as much as $4,000 a month. Still, most workers earn less than $100 a week. For Hanna-Barbera, there is little incentive for going more high-tech. The quality has always been here. That's why we haven't had to introduce uh, high technology. Uh, the quality has been here and the price is here. And as long as those are consistent, then it's like, if it works, why, you know, if it's not broken, why fix it? The drawings are copied onto acetate before going to the painters. Computerized painting systems are gaining ground worldwide, but for now, it's a job for sharp eyes and nimble fingers. This is the camera room where the painted cells are finally put on film, again by hand. A half hour show takes between 15 and 25,000 separate paintings. Here, minus the music and sound effects, is the moment Yuinko has been waiting for. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! Well, I guess it's okay. Uh, it looks good so far. <laughs> the power is yours! For a superhero, as for his animator, your it's all in a day's combined. work. From Manila, I'm John Miller reporting. In India, we are familiar with various kinds of hepatitis. Every monsoon season brings one form or the other, and in some cities, it often takes epidemic form. What we are not so familiar with is hepatitis C, which is considered more deadly than the AIDS virus, and is spread mainly through blood and blood products. We have this report from England. This drug user may be injecting something more deadly than heroin and more pervasive than AIDS. His needle could contain hepatitis C, a virtually incurable virus spread by contaminated blood that now afflicts at least 100 million people worldwide. Unlike other forms of hepatitis, which are spread by contaminated food and water or sexual contact, hepatitis C is spread primarily through blood. Most at risk are intravenous drug users. In some developed countries, up to 80% of them have the virus. But in places like England, haemophiliacs, who can receive blood from thousands of different donors, have also been extremely vulnerable. Bob Purnell was born with haemophilia, but he's dying as a result of a blood transfusion that was infected with hep C. I must have been given some blood uh, products, say around between 20 and 30 years ago, um, which has lay, laid di dormant all, since then. And then it's given me um, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, esophageal viruses, and I've been in hospital 20 times in the last um, 18 months. Bob only discovered he had the virus four years ago when he was rushed to hospital, hemorrhaging uncontrollably from burst veins in his throat. He says he only had one pint of blood left in his body the result of chronic liver failure caused by hepatitis C. These days, Bob needs 16 hours of sleep and cannot be left alone. He and his wife, Jill, have had to close down their upholstery business. I feel bitter, really, that, that it should have happened. You know, why should it, should it have happened to Bob? But um, on the other hand, it, there's nothing I can do about it because it's happened. <laughs> Bob was once an active man. He still enjoys life, 
but he knows that at 55, a successful liver transplant is unlikely. I've done most things I want to do. I don't feel as though I'm ready to die yet, but if that is a fact of life, then um, I think I should accept it. Bob is one of 3,000 haemophiliacs in Britain who caught the disease before donated blood was tested. The virus itself was only identified in 1989, and blood wasn't screened until two years later. This puts anyone who had a transfusion before then at risk. Hepatitis C moves slowly, destroying the liver over a period of 20 years. And because early symptoms like tiredness and low alcohol tolerance can be hard to detect, many people may be infected with the virus without knowing it. Doctors fear that among these numbers may be up to half a million people who used drugs in the 60s and 70s and now lead respectable middle class lives. Anne Clark is one of many such baby boomers whose past has caught up with her. She was shocked to find she had hep C during a routine medical test. It's not something I'm terribly proud of that I would uh, go and uh, yell at the top of a mountain about at all because it's something I did in my past. It's a result of something I did in my past, um, which I don't really regret. It happened in my past, but it's sort of, you thought it was in the past and now, now it's here. Worldwide, at least two and a half times more people have hepatitis C now than will have HIV, the AIDS virus, by the year 2000. But this may still be only the tip of the iceberg. Doctors admit they know less about hepatitis C than they do about AIDS. They don't know, for instance, why the disease is spreading in countries like Japan, where intravenous drug use is rare and the blood supply is uncontaminated. Dr. Christine Lee is a haematologist at the Royal Free Hospital in London. Really, people are very confused as to where a large amount of the infection has come from and indeed how long it's been there, I mean, how, how, when, it, when it first began in the world. Currently, the only standard treatment for hepatitis C is interferon, a cancer drug. But doctors admit the drug has only a 25% success rate and it has unpleasant side effects. But there may be an alternative. A South London clinic is using acupuncture and Chinese herbs to treat the virus. John Tyndall runs this clinic. I've been many times to China to look specifically at the treatment of hepatitis as they, as they have millions of people with hepatitis. And they also have millions of people with hepatitis C. And they have had very good success. While some doctors are skeptical about these claims, they acknowledge that standard interferon treatment is uncertain and its cost of up to $10,000 for a course of treatment makes it an unaffordable luxury for most of the world. Until more is known about the virus, blood screening and clean needles may be the best hope of containing this disease. And now to Panama in faraway Latin America, which is facing an unusual problem, learning to live without foreign troops. Generally, where American troops have gone, there have been demands for them to go home and hostility from the local population. But in Panama, the story is different, both for the Panamanians and the departing troops. Whether it's an early morning jog or jungle training for the next war, U.S. troops at the Southern Command in Panama are a dominating force. These 10 Army and Air Force bases were the launching pad for the 1989 invasion that toppled Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. U.S. military operations all across Latin America are coordinated here. For many Panamanians, the bases have long been a symbol of U.S. hegemony, humiliating proof that their nation has never been truly independent. But all this is supposed to change at the end of the decade. The Panama Canal will be turned back over to Panama, and the Southern Command will transfer to Miami. Thousands of troops and dependents have already begun the retreat. 
I'm kind of like a lot of people around here. I don't have a plan. Lars Morales feels like a Panamanian. Morales' grandfather worked as a riveter on the canal locks, and his father was a canal company accountant. But he'll soon lose his job as a base contract inspector. If I could stay here, even, uh, you know, my, my government job will run out, but if I can stay in Panama and uh, raise the kids, I'd be happy. Good morning. On paper, the American departure looks like a historic opportunity. Besides the canal, Panama gets 4,200 buildings worth an estimated $30 billion. But instead of uncorking champagne, Panamanians are getting cold feet. They're about to lose 5,000 high-paying base jobs. One of the first to go will be Julio Flores, an electrician at Fort Davis. During the invasion that ousted Noriega, he was honored for his round-the-clock labor. But come September, Flores will be ousted from his $12 an hour job when Fort Davis shuts down. A huge number of workers will lose their jobs. We won't die of hunger because Panamanians know how to improvise. But salaries will drop and we're going to have to tighten our belts. These days, fervent nationalism is no longer in fashion. Panamanians are more worried about 14 percent unemployment, and many complain that their government is unprepared to create new employment on the property it will inherit. We've had the experience where these sections that are being, uh, as treaty implementation goes into effect, they turn over areas and they quickly, the grass grows up over your head and the uh, the people tear the buildings apart to get the aluminum to sell, and they, in these areas are just going nowhere. Fort Amador was supposed to be transferred to Panama this year, but the government isn't ready and has requested a delay. Albrook Air Station is now a weed-infested drag strip. Despite the slow start, there may be enough time to attract major investment to the canal zone. Carlos Mendoza, who runs the government agency that will administer base properties, says tentative plans include everything from container ports and marinas to a Panamanian Disneyland. My feeling is that uh, we are going to be able to do it, uh, not in a perfect way. I do not know of any country that has been able to do it uh, without mistakes, but in a most satisfactory manner. For that to happen, Panama will have to move fast. Otherwise, this bonanza of prime real estate is in real danger of becoming an overgrown field of dreams. This is John Otis reporting. We end on a sporty note with a report on dragon boat racing in Hong Kong, which has developed into a major international competition with teams coming from all around the world for what used to be a Chinese sport. For fishermen from Beijing to Bali, teamwork has always meant the difference between life and death. And nowhere can this teamwork be more impressive than at Hong Kong's 20th annual Dragon Boat International Championships. This year, over 40 foreign teams competed against 130 local boats. Dragon boats are traditionally raced during the Tun Ang, or Dragon Boat Festival, celebrated on the fifth day of the fifth lunar month of each year. The races commemorate the drowning death of Chu Yuan, a patriotic poet who some 2,000 years ago was driven to suicide by corrupt officials. The races reenact the frantic attempts of fishermen who paddled out to try to save him. Dragon's heads were added to the boats to ward off evil spirits. Ever since, each year, the boats have been brought back to life and blessed by Taoist priests. But despite its deep roots in Chinese tradition, dragon boating is no longer limited to Asia. The event has mushroomed into a full-fledged international competition, with teams coming from as far away as South Africa, Germany, Australia, the United States, and Canada. It also includes races for women, and for the first time this year, for mixed boats. Each boat holds a helmsman, a drummer, and two rows of ten paddlers who churn the water to froth with over a hundred strokes a minute. 
The intense competition requires the crews to put in hours of grueling training every day before Hong Kong. And once on the starting line, it means coiling the strength gathered over hundreds of hours for a sprint that's over in the blink of an eye. I do this because I love the race. I love the train and I love the race. And there's nothing like getting out there in that harbor like we did this afternoon and being in the finals of a world championship. The competition on the harbor's choppy waters was fierce. Maybe it was the prospect of being beaten by a non-Asian team that helped drive Indonesia to win the men's cup in the world record time of 2 minutes, 25 seconds over the 650-meter court. And all the noise and all the breathing, splashing, water. I mean, I still have the smell of Hong Kong Harbor on me. I haven't gotten a shower yet. But even if Pete McNamara weren't leaving the sport to spend more time with his family, this would still be his last race on his beloved harbor. That's because next year, the bay where the races have been held since 1976 will be filled in with granite gravel, consigning the proud dragons to a polluted river in a faceless new suburb. Whit Mason reporting. That's it from me for this week. Join us next week, same time, same place, for more stories from the world around us.